shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, chapter 4, the throne room of heaven. We have been in Revelation for the last several Sundays. We, we got into chapter 1 as we looked at Jesus Christ in his resurrection glory, as he reveals himself to the churches of today the seven churches in John's time, and they're still going on today. This book of Revelation is relatively chronological. It follows pretty much in sequence in time, and really is not that difficult a book to understand. A lot of people stay away from it, but Revelation takes all the threads of the Bible, all the themes, ties them all together nicely in a knot. And if there's a reference to something in Revelation you don't understand, hopefully you have a cross-reference and you go back and find out where it was in the Old Testament and find it being covered and fulfilled here in Revelation. So chapters 2 and 3 deal with the church age, those who are in Christ, Jews and Gentiles. And we saw in chapter 2 the loveless church in Ephesus, then the persecuted church and the compromising church and the corrupt church. These speak of churches all throughout the church age over the last 2,000 plus years. They also speak to traits of character in our own lives. There's a bit of me which is loveless, a bit of me is persecuted, a bit of me is, I know it's hard to believe, compromising. And part of me may be corrupt as well as I'm not looking at the Lord. Chapter 3, the dead church. There's a part of us that gets dead at times. We need to get it revived. The faithful church by the grace of God, and then the lukewarm church. There's a bit of us there. Lord, show us where we are. Well, that's the church age. Now, in chapter 4, we see the church in heaven. And yes, we're in heaven before the tribulation starts in chapter 6, because the tribulation is not for the church. It's for those who are not part of the church, who have refused Christ. And so chapters 6 through 18 deal with the world being put through the furnace of affliction at the hands of Jesus, as Revelation 6, 17 says. Honey, read that verse, if you would. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So that's the tribulation. It's the wrath of Jesus poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. If you're in Christ, dear friends, and you're watching by television or YouTube or uh, video or, uh, or Facebook, then uh, please give your heart to Christ. And um, chapter 4, we're going to talk about uh, the Lord uh, being in heaven, what it's going to be like. And uh, we're going to first of all get into the throne room. I was thinking about heaven this morning. How many want to go to heaven? How many want to go to, get to heaven in about 15 minutes? <laughs> Two or three hands. <laughs> If I said uh, after COVID, how many want to go to Hawaii and surf in the wintertime, all hands, and how many want to leave right away, we'd all be on that plane. And I thought about that little children's chorus by Salty, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. Yes, I want to see my mom, my dad, my brother, my grandparents, my friends. Uh, I want to see Helen and the others who have uh, made that journey home. But first of all, and most of all, I want to see Jesus. It's all about him. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. And so we're going to see here in heaven this wonderful picture of what heaven is like. And I want you all to pay attention because I don't want you to get up there and say, Golly, what's going on? Those Dumbos, they were at Reach Out. They never did teach you about the throne room of heaven. We want to know about it. I want you guys all to be tour guides up there. And uh, no need to take temperature checks and distancing up there. They just invite them all on in. And um, 
they, um, there was that stupid little joke that was told by someone recently about uh, heaven. St. Peter was at the gate and uh, letting people in, and then this uh, dear lady came, and uh, he said, uh, before you get to heaven, you have to be able to spell. And she said, spell what? He said, well, spell the word love. She said, uh, L-O-V-E. He said, that's right, come on into heaven. So she said, that's easy. He said a few minutes later, I have something I need to do down the street. Would you stand at the door and take my place and do the same thing? She said, sure. She stands at the door. Next thing you know, her ex-husband comes to the <laughs> gate. And he says, what are you doing here? Well, I'm in heaven, and this is heaven, but you have to first of all be able to spell a word. He said, well, sure, what is that? She said, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> I hope it's easier to get into heaven than that. Uh, in any event, um, let's talk about the throne room of God. We're going to talk about the summons of the church to go up into heaven, and then we're going to see what it's like when you get to heaven itself. Honey, let's begin, and if you'll open us in prayer. You've been praying a lot this morning, I so we'll, be, we'll give be, you a rest I'll after give, this. I'll give you real quick. Father God, we just thank you and praise you, and we ask that you would open the scriptures up so that we could learn them and truly be changed by them. We ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to come and be with us. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After the church age, after the church has been taken away, and before we get into that, there are two scriptures that deal with the church going up in the rapture, and I want to just have us review them for those that might not know about it. Uh, somebody says, well, the word rapture is not in the, in the uh, Bible. Well, it is in the Latin Vulgate, but... Uh, the word is uh, caught away. If you don't like rapture, then try caught away. Uh, the Thessalonians were concerned about whether they're going to make it in the rapture, and uh, Paul had to deal with that situation. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, honey. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow for others who have no hope. So don't be worried about those who already passed away, who are in Christ. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So when the Lord returns, he's bringing those loved ones of yours who have passed on in Christ. For this way, for this, well, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So when the Lord returns, if he came at this moment, we're alive. We're not going to get to heaven before those who already passed away, obviously. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's right. This is not the second coming, is it? The second coming is going to be coming to the earth. The second coming is going to happen in Revelation 19 as you and I come back with the Lord. This is actually coming in the air. And what he's doing is he's bringing our loved ones with him. He is shouting. The trumpet is sounding. And then those who are alive, that generation that does not die is going to simply be transformed. The uh, Greek word is the word we get our metamorphosis, changing our body into a resurrection body, and we are caught up. Those who have passed on, my mom and dad were in the Lord. Uh, they are, uh, their ashes are in the backyard there, and they're gonna go first. They're gonna get their resurrection bodies. If I were alive at that moment, I would be joining with them. We'd all go up into heaven uh, together. That is so encouraging. Well, the Bible says out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, every fact is going to be established. So I want another witness besides that. And so God gives it to us in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's begin with verse 50, honey. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, you cannot get to heaven in this body in which you now live. That's a pure place. That's a holy place. We will not be able to make it in these bodies. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I know that was something put on the wall of a Baptist church in Texas 
about in the nursery, right? <laughs> I love we're, those we're not all <laughs> We're not all going to sleep, but we're all going to have to be changed, right? Well, there'll be those that are not going to sleep. They're going to be in that rapture generation. It could be today. You're not going to sleep. You're not going to die first. The Lord's going to come for you, and you'll be changed. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Can I just tell you, i just just trying to remember, before this coronavirus happened, I had a, uh, a dream, a vision. I was sleeping. Um, and I woke up. I don't have dreams that often, but when I do, I remember them. And I had a dream of my first husband, and I had three children with him. And uh, he was rushing around. He was like in a banquet hall. And he used to do that kind of work, believe it or not, somewhat of that kind of work. But um, I, I saw him, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm getting ready. And he said, are you getting your dress ready? And I just looked at him. And I looked at myself, and... I said, yeah, and I woke up. Um, I, I really believe that happened. Am I getting my dress ready? And so the last three months, four months, we've been having a lot of tribulation. But it is a way to get my dress ready. You know, God is doing something in, in me and in my family, and he's probably doing the same thing in, in you. Our garment is gonna, well, it's gonna be what we have done. It's gonna show. Our, our purity and what we've done. We can't see it with these eyes, but it's in the Word of God. I would never have dreamt something like that. I'm not that smart to know those things. But is that biblical to be able to, not the matter of dreaming about your first husband, I understand that, but is it biblical that you're busy making your wedding dress now? I know one of our ladies made a wedding dress for one of the young ladies, and uh, it was, a, uh, it was a beautiful dress. I saw a picture of it. Um, am I making my wedding dress? I can't even sew. Well, is it scriptural? My mother used to say, if somebody's saying something like that, give me chapter and verse. So I'm going to challenge Miss Kelly. Is there a chapter and verse to describe that? And she's going to show me Revelation 19. I, I went right to him, you know. Revelation 19, <clears throat> verse 7. Read that. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife had made, has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's the righteous acts. You're making your wedding garment. She's absolutely right. And when I get up there to heaven, probably before you, I'll see Lenny, introduce myself to him. And I'm going to tell him. Oh, Make me cry. <laughs> she I still just cry him. all day. I'm going to tell her, him that, you know, where you failed, I failed. He failed. He's Italian. And he always tried to get his wife, who was not Italian, to put pepperoni in their sauce. And she didn't do it. She married me. My mother taught me to put pepperoni in the sauce. Do you think I get pepperoni in my sauce? Like it. I don't really like it that much in the sauce. We get, we get, this, we get sausage, and it's not even hot sauce. I do it is, sometimes. For so when I get to heaven, after I see Jesus, I want to say, Lenny, I couldn't do it either. So, and I was uh, raised in an Italian family. I was adopted. All right. Well, and enough of that. Let's get back to 1 Corinthians 15 here. And um, So we're not all going to sleep. What's going to happen here is this, this is going to be the return of the Lord in the rapture, verse 52. <clears throat> We're getting you to cry a lot, aren't we? It's terrible. You'll have to take a nap afterwards. Terrible. All right. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And notice in this bit of prophecy about the future, both scriptures say the same thing. The Lord's going to return not to the earth, but in the air with the trumpet. He's going to call us up. 
Those who are alive are going to be changed immediately into resurrection bodies. Those who passed on ahead of time are going to just before them, they've got a six-foot head start if they're buried six feet deep, and they're going to have their bodies changed. We all go together uh, into heaven. And uh, the important thing is, and here is where I think so many who have majored in prophecy, and I used to immerse myself with these teachers 40-plus years ago, they get all into the erasmataz and the excitement and all the thrills of the, of the knowledge. They do not deal with my practical walk. And all of prophecy in the Bible is to say, this is what's going to happen in the future. Now here is how you must conduct yourself right now. And give us 55 again, honey. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So always be steadfast. Peter talks about the future. He goes way out into the future about this heaven and this earth being burned and destroyed. And he talks about the fact that we are to conduct ourselves properly uh, we're going to look for a new heaven and a new earth. And he says here that uh, we are to be steadfast. And uh, he says here, let's, uh, let's look at verse 17. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. You keep busy. You keep busy. When I got the news of the, my departure date from Vietnam to come home, I was thrilled. But it was several months out in the future. What did I do? Lay in my bed for the next two months? Be steadfast. I had to be busy right until the last moment until I had to get on that plane and head home. So the Lord's going to come, maybe in our lifetime. Uh, be busy. You've got things to do. Make that wedding guest uh, that you're talking about. But here, all of that was to say, as we now get into our subject of the throne room, we've dealt with the church age, and now in verse 4, we are being caught up and we are being brought into the throne room itself. The rapture takes place in that very first verse there. Read that again, chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Oh, I look forward to that, don't you? Come up here. I want to show you what is going to be like in heaven. And so, go ahead, honey. And now here's this wonderful vision he has. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Whoa, this is the throne room of God. He was this in the Spirit. The, he was in the That's Holy Spirit. That's what happens yep. when you leave your yep. Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to take Sometimes you there. Sometimes you dream. The Holy Spirit's taking him into the very throne room of God. This is the clearest picture we have in Scripture of what it's like in heaven. The second clearest picture would be back in the tabernacle in Moses' time, where he said, make a model of all these articles of furniture, because that's going to represent what's in heaven. This is our hope. This is our goal. This is what we're looking forward to. So this is the throne room of God. One sat on the throne, no doubt the Father. And he who sat on there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So there he is like a jasper. Jasper in that day was a clear diamond look. And of course sardius is what color? It's red, speaking of the blood of Jesus Christ, which has cleansed us from our sin. Amen. Pure, clear sorry, jasper and blood red sardius. I bet we've never seen jewels like that. The purity of Jesus because of the blood of Jesus. Verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Ah, these are the representatives. Now, there's numerology in the Bible, and 24 is a number of representation. 24 represents a greater body. And so these 24 elders might well be the church. Some have said, well, 12 are the church and 12 are redeemed Israel. In any event, I want to be there. And I'm represented there by these elders, and I'm excited about them. Look what color their robes are. 
white mm -hmm. robes. White for purity, purity, holiness, the blood of Jesus. And they had crowns of gold. Crowns of gold, the, the greatest value up there. Gold. Oh, people bought, they, they, we've had wars down here. People have cheated, lied, and whatever for gold. Up there, it's just asphalt. He says, you're going to walk on gold. God, God can take care of that. You've got a problem financially. COVID is hitting you hard financially, and God bless you. We're all having to make adjustments. But God can provide for you. My mother took that old scripture that you know, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He also, she said, owns all the minerals and what have you underneath those hills as well. So if he needs to get some gold out of there for you, he can do it. He can provide for it. All right, so there are the crowns of gold. You and I have that value of gold uh, in that crown because of Jesus. Verse 5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. All right, let's stop there. What is that all about? Whoa, I expected some real soft music up there. Uh, you know, as the deer panteth for. But here there's lightnings, thunderings, voices. Go back to the Old Testament. Always go back to the Old Testament from Revelation. Where do you find lightnings, thunderings, shaking of the earth? Where do you find that? At Mount Sinai, when God is giving the law, he says, don't even come near this mountain and don't even touch it or you'll die. And so when God gives that law, he says, this is my law. And you better not break it. Well, the lightnings, the thunderings, and the voices speak of God's law, which now has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And let's go on now to the seven lamps. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits, capital S, of God. Now, some people struggle with the Trinity. <laughs> we don't want to have to add seven Holy Spirits on top of that. That would be a lot. Seven is the number of completion, completion fulfillment. So the seven spirits speaks of the Holy Spirit in his seven-fold aspect. And in the Old Testament, where do you find it? Isaiah chapter 11 Isaiah talks 700 years before Jesus about the fact that the Messiah is going to be anointed by, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amazing. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his, root, out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So here we're talking about Jesus. And he will have the Holy Spirit. And see if you can count seven aspects and ministries of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back. It's all found in verse 2 of Isaiah 11. The Spirit, Spirit of, of the, the Lord. Lord. Number one is he is of the Lord, right? Shall rest upon him. Upon Jesus. Number two. The Spirit of wisdom. The Holy Spirit is your spirit of wisdom. You need wisdom? Call on the Holy Spirit. Number three. Understanding. I don't understand what's going on here, Lord. Help me, Holy Spirit. Counsel. Give me counsel, Lord. I'm really confused. Might. I need your power, your strength. Knowledge. What's going on, the spirit Lord? Spirit of knowledge. Teach me. And finally. The fear of the Lord. I need to fear the Lord. You should pray this. People should pray, Lord. Holy Spirit. Why don't you pray then to verse 2 then? Show us how you would pray that. Okay. Um, fa Heavenly Father. Your word says in Isaiah 11, verse 2, that the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. I ask, Lord, that the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon those who are listening today, that the Spirit of wisdom and understanding would be given to the people that are listening today, that they would cry out to you for counsel and might, and, Lord, you would give them counsel and might, and that the Spirit of knowledge would be upon them, that they would have knowledge of what you're doing in their lives, what's going on in the world, and that the fear of the Lord would be with them, that they would have a healthy fear of you, Lord. We ask this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Whoa, release the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. So there's your seven spirits, and the seven, let's continue here, uh, the seven lamps of fire were burning. Fire, it, it indicates what? Or, uh, Purifying, purifying, right? Yep, cleansing. John purifying. the Baptist said about Jesus, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and, and with fire. fire. My late mother used to say, Lord, turn up the furnace another hundred degrees and burn out of me all 
that displeases you. And boy, the Lord did it. And you know, you're surprised when you think you're good. I remember way before my daughter had a traumatic brain injury, I thought I was really a good Christian. I really did. And then she had the traumatic brain injury, and I started realizing that God was using that injury. This is way back when. And I thought, oh my goodness, what, how horrible. And then as you go on in life, you start to see how God burns this away and burns this away, and you look back, you don't see it. You know, I see that with my children now. You know, they don't understand some things we say to them. And, and so, you know, we may not see the fruit of everything later on because it has to be burned away, right? Burn out of me all that displeases you, Lord. Now, before the throne, verse 6. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Sea of glass. When you get up there to heaven and you see the throne, there's going to be a sea of glass, clear like crystal. I don't understand what the sea of glass like crystal is. From Revelation, because I have to go back into the Old Testament to realize what it's fulfilling. When Moses set up that tabernacle, which was the picture of heaven, as you walked into the tabernacle, not much bigger than this room, there was a big bronze altar where they had the animal sacrifices, mm -hmm. looking forward to the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so they were actually barbecuing the meat there. Some barbecue was totally burned up, like burnt offerings. Some medium rare, thank you. And they would eat it with the priests but they were actually sacrificing these animals on that first article, the bronze or brass altar. You walked behind that, and there was a laver, a big basin of water. Practically speaking, what was it for? My grandfather was a German butcher from Germany and established a place down in Poughkeepsie. He stands there in his nice white uh, apron, and it says Carl Lundstedt's meat market, and he would get his big German hands bloodied with that meat. What did he have to do afterwards? Had to wash his hands. So practically speaking, those priests had to, after they butchered the animals, they had to wash their hands. But spiritually speaking, it talks about the cleansing and the purifying, going into the presence of the Lord. It talks about water baptism, if you will, washing away. Not that the water baptism washes away from sin, but it pictures the washing away. And so here we see that it's not wet, it's solid. Because the sacrifice has been completed, the church is home, and no longer is there a need for cleansing from sin and in heaven. It's now a remembrance, it's a memorial of what has already taken place. So here is the labor or the cleansing, now solidified, now complete. We've made it home. And there in the midst of the throne are these four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. What does that mean? You can see everywhere. No, they're smart. <laughs> they're smart. These creatures represent uh, the uh, omniscience of the Lord Jesus. They're not God. But they represent the omniscience, the all-knowing nature of the Lord. Now look at these creatures. Let's look at verse 7. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature like a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So the four living creatures, they have uh, different appearances. One is like a lion. The second one is like a calf. The third is uh, like uh, a man. And the fourth is like a living creature. So we take this back to Genesis. Always go back to the Old Testament if you want to understand what Revelation's like. Genesis chapter 9, and we find our boy Noah getting off the ark with his family and establishing a new creation, if you will. And Genesis chapter 9, beginning in 8, verse 8, talks about that. 
and the Lord is setting up that rainbow for him and uh, indicating I'll never destroy the, uh, uh, the earth again by the, uh, the flood. That's the purpose of the rainbow. It's also a picture of hope, um, of, of, of a better... We see right now there are a lot of rainbows because of COVID, looking forward to the Lord delivering us. And if you read there, you're going to see uh, um, how the Lord is going to deliver from uh, the flood every living creature. And there, as you read that passage, you're going to see he re refers to the various aspects of humanity. There's the human being, there is also uh, fowl, there's cattle and beast. That represents creation. That represents living beings. Adam and Eve were given dominion over the fowl, the cattle, and the beast. Until they sinned, lost their power, lost their right, and that's why we have all kinds of trouble, even with the... See, sin the, is always about destruction. Yep. So now you take your little Yorkie out in the backyard, and you get panicked. And she sends a text to all the whole family, don't let little Faith the Yorkie out in the backyard, because up in the air circling is a hawk, ready to grab her, etc. So we live in fear all the time because of our sin nature. In any event, here are these representing all of creation now redeemed in heaven. Some see this, I don't think it's the primary meaning, but I like to always look for Jesus, and I hope you do too. I want to look for Jesus in every scripture I can find. And so back to verse 7. The first living creature was like a lion. A lion. That speaks of Matthew. Matthew was writing to Israel about Jesus being the lion of the tribe of Judah. Then the second one is like a calf. And Mark speaks of Jesus as the calf or the servant, the humble servant of God. The third living creature is like a man. And Luke spoke of the humanity of Jesus. Amen. And finally, fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And John spoke of the deity of the Lord Jesus. So here I see Jesus as the king, the lion. Amen. I see him as the humble servant. Yes. I see him as the most perfect man. Mm. And of course, our beloved God. Amazing. It's always about Jesus. Well, you know how people are missing so much that don't, people who don't know the Lord. That's why salvation comes first. They need to come to Christ, right? Then they'll come and learn about the word of God. That's right. This is a mystery and it's everything in this book is for life and godliness. The important thing is, what are they doing up there in heaven? Are they floating around? They're floating around with that harp. Can, can you read music? Can you play a harp? No, who knows, who knows what you're going to be doing up there? You're going to be praising God. That's what this is all about. Chapters 4 and 5 are about praising God. What are my parents doing right now? Their, little, their bodies in the ashes are in the backyard. Are they back there? No, they're not. Where are they? They're in heaven with the Lord. What are they doing? Playing the harp? Doubt it. Praising God? Definitely. Look at what they're saying. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. He's holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Write that on a piece of paper. Put that on the refrigerator. Put that on your mirror. But I don't know what to say in my praise. I guess we get so tired. What song should I sing? Who cares? Just praise God. Just say, holy Lord, love you. And then go on, verse 9, honey. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Amen. It's so beautiful. We, we, we think we're so smart. I think when I read things like that, we think we're so smart as humans that we know everything. And even as Christians, we often think we're so smart. And if we only knew how we really aren't that very smart at all, everything is in the word of God. It's here. And look at these 24 elders. What are they doing? They are taking their crowns and they are casting them down 
before the Lord. The throne him, put him at his feet. When did they get the crowns? At the judgment seat of Christ. Paul talks about that to the Corinthian church. At the judgment seat of Christ, Jerry Lynn come forward and here is a crown, the crown of life, a crown of uh, doing good works on this particular uh, day and another crown maybe for that. And then uh, another situation that I did. So, I, um, went to, so I remember when you taught um, me this yeah. and I said, I can't keep my crown. You got to give it back. And I had to learn how important, I mean, I kind of knew that, but you know, I was kidding, but not really kidding. And I realized true love, I'm going to be so grateful to the Lord. I don't want to keep my crown. I'm going to put him at his feet. This is God. Give it back to him. Jerry, you did a great job in teaching there on July 5. Great teaching, Jerry. Well, thank you very much. I've had a lot of education, and I am pretty bright, and I went to school. And blah, 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 blah. Guess what happens to that reward? You can do that, that here on the, on the earth. Yeah. <laughs> Guess what happens to that reward? That's the Pharisee. That reward is burned right up. On the other hand, Jerry, thanks for the teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. All because of him. Keep your reward and then give it back to him in heaven. Don't Go, lose it down here. Give all glory and honor to the Lord. Yeah. I know, I remember an, uh, a pastor who taught me for years and, um, and he, uh, whenever you'd say, he'd say, praise the Lord. <laughs> he'd whistle, praise the Lord. He'd always yeah. gave every glory to the Lord. Yeah. And really that's what we're supposed to be doing is give, give the glory to the Lord, not to ourselves. Yeah, and you don't need to be uh, disdainful and say, well, it's not me, it's the Lord. Just say, well, thank you. Isn't Jesus great? Right. Just give it back to him. One of the most interesting songs I've ever heard in Southern Gospel music is by Greater Vision. And I don't have the title in front of me here, but it's about casting our crowns before him. And one of the, that's one of the most gifted uh, quartet groups uh, out there. And uh, the, the uh, Rodney, I forgot his last name, is the author of that thing. He talks about the fact that he gets up to heaven and he sees this whole pile of crowns. And he says, what are these crowns? Wow. Those are the crowns that the saints have put before the Lord. Wow. Because whatever we have that's good has come from him and because of him. And so what Imagine are they saying? Imagine just coming and seeing all those crowns. Oh, it's going to be fabulous. Wow. And notice what they're saying. Mom and dad are saying this today. Your, your dear dad is saying this. And yes, Lenny, who hopefully has some pepperoni in his sauce up there, is saying this He was working well. in a banquet house. He, he's busy Banque with, he, was in a, he was in a banquet room. Yeah, he's all dressed up in white and black he's and, dressed and up. looking great. And a uh, handsome guy. He yeah, was a handsome and he fellow. Was, he was very, and, and I look back at that dream, he was young. So I think we're kind of, I don't, I don't think we're going to, we're going to see differently too. Big, big charismatic personality. I'll enjoy seeing him. Anyway, we'll talk about you for a long time until you come <laughs> join us. But what are they doing up there? Look at verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive you and make me cry. <laughs> to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. You're worthy, O Lord. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our obedience. You're worthy of our love. You're worthy of our sacrifice. Lord, may all the glory and the honor and the power go to you. Not to me. Amen. To you. For you created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. By your will. I was created to praise him, to honor him, to bless him. But I don't want to praise God now. I want to wait till I get to heaven. Why wait? He's worthy of it now. And incidentally, I've never heard this taught before, but I'm kind of thinking that if I miss mom and dad and my brother and your dad, who was always a gentleman, always treated me well, I only knew him for six years. If I miss them mm -hmm. and would like to draw closer to them, why don't I join them? If they're praising God now, as I praise God, I'm getting closer to Jesus. And in a sense, I'm even getting closer to them. Throne room of God. I'm looking forward to getting there. Maybe not today. Maybe another day, as, as the Lord decides. Uh, but heaven is a he wonderful place. He would go today. He's, you're I would, fine. I would go. Take, would. take a couple of dogs with me here. But again, let's go back to what Salty said. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. Mm-hmm. I want to see my Savior's face. Amen. Heaven is a wonderful place. Let's pray. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to hear your word today. We thank you for listening to Pastor. I want a blessing and how he's brought forth the word with clarity and truth. We pray, Father, that you would just uh, guard it in our hearts. Help us to truly learn from it, hear what you want us to say, and, and give it out to others this week. We thank you for what you're going to do in our lives, and we look forward to uh, serving you this week. We bless you, and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, and for those of you who are not sure that you're heaven-bound, you're backslidden, you're, you've never really come to the Lord. I had to come to the Lord at age 35. I didn't know Jesus was mm -hmm. the Son of God who died for my sins. Perhaps you're in that category. We want to give you a chance to get ready to go with us. 30, so 40 plus years ago, my sister-in-law came up from uh, Florida with her big, beautiful blue eyes and her Kentucky soft accent. And she said, Jerry, she said, I just gave my heart to Christ. I want to be in heaven. And I want you there with me. And of course, I blew it off and said, well, that's very nice, Nancy. I'm happy for you. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, I got saved and called my sister. And she said, oh, happy for you. And, but what about for you? I'd like to have you out there in heaven with us, those who are here. I'd like to think that uh, we can get as many as possible. Heavenly City is going to be a big place. We're going to see those dimensions later on. Huge. More than half the size of this country. You have to cubed. Br bring other people you know, in, you people gotta, you into the in. kingdom. You've got to keep telling people, and yeah. some will be saved. Now, because I came late to the Lord in life and went to seminary and all, I didn't get the basic childhood ways of remembering things until I heard a song about Three weeks ago, turns out I've got a family down in Tennessee where I come from called the McCamies, and I can hardly stand and listen to them. They all sing like this and talk like this, and I thought, my, thank God I got out of there. And uh, the McCamies, and they're, they're all, all gals, and they just, they, they love the Lord, and they talked about the ABCs of salvation. Well, I didn't understand a word they said in English, but I went ahead and I looked on the internet for the ABCs of salvation. Turns out every kid learns it in Sunday school. I should have gone to Sunday school see, as a kid. See, see that? that? Hey, what does a, a stand for? Admit. Admit that you're a sinner. Honey, give me a scripture, would you? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans a 3, is 23. Admit, admit that you're a sinner. And then what, what does he say in 1 John? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. A is admit. What's B stand for? Believe. Believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again as payment for those sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, John 3.16. A, admit. B, believe. C, confess. Confess Jesus publicly. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 to 10. And so if these scriptures have spoken to your heart and you are ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I, Father. I admit I am a sinner. I admit I am a sinner. And I repent of my sins. And I repent of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. And was raised again as payment for those sins. And was raised again as payment for those sins. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for my new spiritual life. Thank you, Lord, for my new spiritual life. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And for our television audience, we want to tell you that we appreciate your joining us today. We always like to sign off on our program with these dear words. Reach out to Jesus and reach out to one another with his love. Shalom. God bless you. by this moment your needs to supply